If you're going to speak about something, you need to know a lot about it. You need to know three or four times as much as you're going to speak about at minimum. So first of all, you have to do your background research. You have to have multiple stories at hand that you can use to illustrate your point. And you have to have a point. You have to organize what you're talking about around a problem. So before I go on stage to speak on my tour, I always sit for half an hour, some of which involves usually about five minutes of anxiety. And I think, okay, there's a problem I'm trying to address tonight, a central problem or a theme. What is it? It might be courage. It might be responsibility. It might be meaning. Um, I think, and th that serves as an organizing principle. So that would be the point. And then basically I organize, say, a dozen stories around that. And I, I can kind of arrange them in it as a journey. And it's a journey that circles the main point. And so I'm trying to explore it to say what I think about courage, let's say, but to take what I'm thinking farther than I've taken it already. And so that I can plot out, you know, little five minute stories that I have that are associated with courage. And then I can talk to the audience. And I would say, talk about what you know, use your personal experience, because that's that's something that you're actually a master of. You can bring in other material, but it has to be tied to the real world through your own experience. Otherwise, it's not real. It's also very good to speak directly to the audience, to the individuals in the audience, because I'm always looking at a single person, one after another, and focusing on them and talking to them, just like you'd have a conversation with someone. And that way I can see if they're following along. And I'm always listening to the audience what I really like to hear from the audience is no noise at all, silence. Because if the audience, especially, you know, if it's a couple of hundred or a couple of thousand people, if the audience is dead silent, then I know that I'm on the right track. And so and the other thing I would say is you're telling stories. So every fact that you relate or every set of facts has to be tied to a story. There has to be a meaningful output, which is something like, why is it important to your life that you know this fact? How is it related to how you're going to conduct yourself moving forward or how you're going to see the world? So because that's kind of the essence of meaning. How does this fact change the way you perceive the world or act in the world? That's the meaning of the fact and facts without meaning are dull. So you need to know that you need to tell the truth. That's for sure. And and and, and I mean, for me, my talks are really they're an attempt to explore a set of ideas in the most truthful way that I can manage. And that's also an adventure because letting yourself speak freely about a topic, you don't always know where it's going to go. And so, but that also hooks in the audience because they're not, they're along for the ride, right? And there's a risk. The risk is you might forget where you are. You might lose the thread. You might say something you regret. You might get confused. And it's this, the talk should be a process of exploration, like a journey that you're taking the audience along on. It's the same when you're reading a novel, like a great novel isn't exactly plotted out from beginning to end to begin with. The author is taking himself or herself and you on an ad intellectual adventure through the, through the character development. And the characters have to be allowed to live and to express themselves. And the novel needs to unfold. It's like a colloquy between the conscious mind and the unconscious source of inspiration. And the novel is actually a journey through a characterological landscape. And the author shouldn't know where he or she's going to end up at the beginning. Same with an artist and who's, who's writing a song or, or, or a piece of music or a piece of visual art. There has to be play and exploration along the way. And so you also don't want to deliver an over-prepared talk in my estimation, or at least that's not how I do it. You want to have a theme, you want to have a body of knowledge from which you can draw on, and then you want to be actively exploring the idea in front of the audience. And that's very gripping for everyone, including you. And so, and you should learn something from the talk. It's an opportunity to think on your feet. And anyways, that's my style of lecturing. Um, it's, it's a trapeze act without a safety net, I would say. And that's part of what makes it gripping is that there's a high probability of failure. And I would say with any performance that's going to be that on the edge of the seat gripping, there has to be a high probability of failure. And that's why I don't speak with notes. 
Um, if you speak with notes, which you might have to if you're a beginning speaker, then you cannot fail because you can always read the notes. And so there's a, there's a net. You'll fall in the net, but you won't die. But you'll never do anything spectacular. So that's the thing is if you're going to do something spectacular, you have to take the risk. And if you're going to take the risk, you have to think on your feet. And then you also have to have something to think about. You have to be been working on this material. You know, I've been working on the stuff I talk about for 30 years, for tens of thousands of hours. And so I have that reservoir of knowledge, I suppose. And, you know, whenever I read something new, I'm slotting it into the knowledge structure that I use to generate my talks. And I'm reading all the time. And lots of the things I read, I forget. They're not relevant to my central mission, whatever that happens to be. It looks like some... It looks something like the delineation of the relationship between responsibility and meaning and and maybe responsibility meaning and perception it's something like that and so i have a central concern or deeper than that in some sense um, my central concern was how to ensure personally that if i was tempted in a situation like the situations that arose in the soviet union and nazi germany that i wouldn't fall prey to those totalitarian systems and act in the re reprehensible manner that so many people acted in. That's really been a driving concern of mine. And, and that bleeds over into the relationship between meaning and responsibility and perception. So there's a core set of problems that I'm working on and every talk is an attempt to further develop those. So you also have to have a problem, you know? You think, well, you don't want to have a problem. It's like, yeah, you do. You want to, you want to, you've got problems anyways. <laughs> If you're alive, you've got problems. Pick one of them. It can be your problem. And that can be the problem you try to address, whatever that happens to be. And then you have something to talk about. How am I going to address this problem? How can this problem be addressed? So you need to have a problem, too, if you're going to talk. Just like you need to have a problem if you're going to write. Because the writing is an attempt to solve the problem. And so is the talking. If you're not trying to solve a problem, what the hell are you doing talking? Why should anyone care? It's got to be a real problem, too. Like a... You know, a nail biter of a problem, a dragon of a problem. And if, if it's a problem that everyone else shares, so much the better. So, and then you grapple with it. We're having a conversation. I'm deciding I'm going to listen to you, right? That's different than pe how people generally communicate because usually when they communicate, they're doing something like, okay, we're gonna have a conversation and I'm gonna tell you why I'm right and I'll win if you agree. Or maybe you're having a conversation where, I don't know what you're trying to do. Maybe you're trying to impress the person you're talking to. So you're not listening to them at all. You're just thinking about what you're going to say next. Okay, so that's not this. This is, you might have something to tell me. And so I'm going to listen on the off chance that you'll tell me something that would really be useful for me to know. And so you could think about it as an, as an extension of the Piagetian... You know, Piaget talked about the fundamental... The fundamentally important element of knowledge being to describe how knowledge is sought, the process by which knowledge is generated. Well, if you agree with me and I find that out, I know nothing more than I knew before. I just know what I knew before. And maybe I'm happy about that because, you know, it didn't get challenged. But I'm no smarter than I was before. But maybe you're different than me, and so while I'm listening to you, you'll tell me something I wouldn't, I don't like. Maybe it's something I find contemptible or difficult, whatever. Maybe you'll find, you'll tell me something I don't know, and then I won't be quite as stupid. And then maybe I won't run painfully into quite as many things. And that's a really useful thing to know, especially if you live with someone and you're trying to make long-term peace with them, is they're not the same as you. And their way they look at the world and the facts that they pull out of the world aren't the same as your facts. And even though you're going to be overwhelmed with the proclivity to demonstrate that you're right, it is the case that two brains are better than one. And so maybe nine of the 10 things they tell you are dispensable, or maybe even 49 out of 50, but one thing, all you need to get out of the damn conversation is one thing you don't know. And one of the things that's very cool about a good psychotherapeutic session is that the whole conversation is like that. All you're doing is trying to express the truth of the situation as clearly as possible. That's it. And so, now, Roger's proposition, and I'll tell you why he derived it, was that 
if you have a conversation like that with someone, it will make both of you better. It'll make both of you psychologically healthier. So there's an implicit presupposition that the exchange of truth is curative. Well, that's a very cool idea. I mean, it's a very deep idea. Uh, I think it's the most profound idea. It's the, it's the idea upon, Western civil, upon which Western civilization, although not only Western civilization, is actually predicated. The idea that truth produces health. But for Rogers, that was the entire purpose of the Psychotherapeutic Alliance. You come to see me because you want to be better. You don't even know what that means necessarily, neither do I. We're going to figure that out together. But you come and you say, look, things are not acceptable to me, and maybe there's something I could do about that. So that's the minimal precondition to engage in therapy. Something's wrong, you're willing to talk about it truthfully, and you want it to be better. Without that, the therapeutic relationship does not get off the ground and so then you might ask well what relationships are therapeutic and the answer to that would be if you have a real relationship it's therapeutic if it isn't what you have is not a relationship god only knows what you have you're a slave they're a tyrant you know you're both butting heads with one another it's a primate dominance hierarchy dispute oh i don't know you're like two cats in a barrel or two people with their hands around each other's throats but you, what you have is not a relationship so all right, we may say that the greater the communicated congruence of experience, awareness, and behavior on the part of one individual, that's, that's a reference to the same idea that I was describing with regards to Jung. So let's say you come and talk to me and you want things to go well. Well, I'm going to have to more or less be one thing because if I'm all over the place, you can't trust any continuity in what I say. There's no, and you, there's no reason for you to believe that I'm capable of actually telling you I'm capable of expressing anything that's true. So the truth is something that emerges as a consequence of getting yourself lined up and beating all the, what would you call, all the impurities out of your, out of your, out of your soul, for lack of a better word. You have to be integrated for that to happen. And you do that at least in part by wanting to tell the truth. The more the ensuing relationship will involve a tendency towards reciprocal communication with the same qualities. So one of the things, well, I've been quite influenced by Rogers, one of the things I try to do in my therapeutic sessions is first of all to listen, to really listen. And then well, while I listen, I watch. And while I'm listening, things will happen in my head. You know, maybe I'll get a little image of something or I'll get a thought or a question will emerge and then I'll just tell the person what that is. But it's sort of directionless, you know, it's not like I have a goal except that we're trying to make things better. I'm on the side of the person, I'm on the side of the part of the person that wants things to be better, not worse. And so then we, those parts of us have a dialogue and the consequence of that dialogue is that certain things take place and then I'll just tell the person what happened. And it isn't that I'm right. That's not the point. The point is, is that they get to have an hour where someone actually tells them what they think. Here's the impact you're having on me. You know, this is making me angry. This is making me happy. This is really interesting. This reminds me of something that you said an hour ago that I don't quite understand. And the whole, the whole point is not for either person to make the proposition or convince the other that their position is correct, but merely to have an exchange of experience about how things are set up. And it's extraordinarily useful for people because it's often difficult for anyone to find anyone to talk to that will actually listen. And so another thing that's really strange about this listening is that if you listen to people, they will tell you the weirdest bloody things so fast you just cannot believe it. So if you're having a conversation with someone and it's dull, it's because you're stupid. That's why. You're not listening to them properly because they're weird. They're like wombats or albatrosses or rhinoceroses or something like they're strange creatures and so if you were actually communicating with them and they were telling you how weird they really are it would be it would be anything but boring so and you can ask questions that's a really good way of listening but you know one of roger's points is well you have to be oriented properly in order to listen and the orientation has to be look what i want out of this conversation is that the place we both end up is better than the place we left that's it that's what I'm after. And if you're not after that, you got to think, why the hell wouldn't you be after that? What could you possibly be after that would be better than that? You walk away smarter and more well-equipped for the world 
than you were before you had the conversation, and so does the other person. Well, maybe if you're bitter and resentful and angry and anxious and, you know, generally annoyed at the world, then that isn't what you want. You want the other person to walk away worse and you too, because you're full of revenge. But, you know, you'll get what you want if you do that. So, we know from our research that such empathic understanding, it's already defined that. I want to hear you. I want to hear what you have to say so we can clarify it and move forward. I want to have your best interests in mind. And mine as well, but, you know, both at the same time. Your families too, if we could manage that. that. We're after making things better. We know from our research that such empathic understanding, understanding with a person, not about them, is such an effective approach that it can bring about major changes in personality. Some of you may be feeling that you listen well to people and that you have never seen such results. The chances are very great that you have not been listening in the manner that I've described. Fortunately, I can suggest a little experiment that you can do to test the quality of your understanding. The next time you get into an argument with your wife or your friend or a small group of friends, stop the discussion for a moment and for an experiment institute this rule. Each person can speak up for himself only after he has first restated the ideas and feelings of the previous speaker accurately. What accurately means is they have to agree with your restatement. Now that's an annoying thing to do because if someone is talking to you and you disagree with them, the first thing you want to do is take their argument, make the stupidest possible thing out of it that you can, that's the straw man, and then demolish it. It's like, so then you can walk away feeling good about it and you know, you primate dominus, dominated them really nicely. So, but that isn't what you do. You say, okay, well, I'm going to take what you told me and maybe I'm even going to make your argument stronger than the one you made. That's useful if you're dealing with someone that you have to live with because maybe they can't bloody well express themselves very well, but they have something to say. So you make their argument strong. All right, then you see what this would mean. It would mean that be before presenting your own point of view, it would be necessary for you to really achieve the other speaker's frame of reference, to understand his thoughts and feelings so well that you could summarize them for him. Sounds simple, doesn't it? But if you'll try it, you'll find that it's the most difficult thing that you've ever done. Well, I'll tell you a couple of strange things, that, that, things that I don't really understand. The first is, when we've done the analysis of the effects of the future authoring program, it has had a different, in, differential impact on men and it's had a particularly differential impact on what I would call excluded men. And so that would be non-Western ethnic minority men or, or what, majority men who aren't doing very well. So for example, at Mohawk College, the future authoring program had a particularly robust effect on Mohawk College students who were men who hadn't done very well in high school and who hadn't picked a major that had a destination, a career destination at its end. So you can imagine those people are, they have an ambiguous relationship with the idea of education. And they're not oriented specifically towards a goal. They're not very motivated. Now, why did it have a differential effect on men? That's a good question. Well, first of all, the women are doing better. So it might just be a matter of the fact that it does better for people who aren't doing as well, and at the moment, most of them are men. I don't believe, I think that might be part of it. But I don't believe that's all of it. I think that part of the reason that women are doing better is because they're agreeable. And so if a system sets out a structure and says, here's a pathway to attainment, the women won't rebel against that, they'll go along with it. And that's working very well for them at the moment. The men, especially the men on the disagreeable end of the distribution, and there's way more men on the disagreeable end of the distribution than there are women, right? That's what you get from, if you look at overlapping normal distributions. So there's the male distri female distribution for agreeableness, male distribution for agreeableness. Tremendous overlap. Okay, women are higher. All the really agreeable people are women. All the really disagreeable people are men. And maybe the real differences occur at the extremes, right? So, so and it's, it's a very interesting side effect of overlapping distributions. So they, people can be mostly the same, but that can still produce radical differences. Disagreeable men won't do anything they don't want to do. They just say, up yours. I'll go home and play video games. Are you with me? I'm not listening to your stupid classes. And why should I work for you? I'll just go have fun. I'll do my own thing. I don't think they're motivated. And so then if you take the men who are like that and you say, okay, what do you want? You can have what you want, but you have to figure out what it is. 
So then they write down what they want. And they think, oh, hey, well, that might be worth having, so maybe I'll put some effort into it. That's what it looks like to me. Now, you know, that's weak evidence. And this is a weak argument. But I'm trying to stretch out my understanding to account for this. But I'll tell you something else that's really weird. I don't understand this either. So, more than 90% of the people who watch my videos on YouTube are men. Now that's weird because not about 80% of psychology students are women. So that is not what you would expect, right? You'd expect that the majority of them would be women. And you might say, well, it's because of the political stance I've taken. And I thought, well, that's possible. So I went and looked at the demographic data because I have that. Well, before I did any of the political videos, 85% of my viewers were men. So it's actually increased a bit. It's increased by 6%. And that's not trivial, but it was still overwhelmingly men. So that was interesting. I thought, what the hell? Why is that exactly? And then now I've been watching crowds when I've been talking to them. And the crowds that have come to see me in person. This happened at the University of Toronto free speech debate. And I actually noticed it and commented on it before the debate took place because I was talking about intrinsic differences between men and women. And I looked around the room and I thought, hmm, hey, 80% of the people in this room are men. So I had all the men sta women stand up and then all the men stand up. I said, look, like, here's a natural experiment. For some reason, 80% of the people who showed up to this are men. Now, everybody thought I was kind of cracked to, to do that. And it was a risk, you know, and, and, and I, but I thought, no, there's something going on here. And then what's interesting now is that every public appearance that I've made that's related to the sort of topics that we're discussing is overwhelmingly men. It's like, it's like 85 to 90 percent. And so I thought, wow, that's weird. Like, what the hell's going on here exactly? And then the other thing I've noticed is that I've been talking a lot to the crowds that I've been talking to, not about rights, but about responsibility, right? Because you can't have the bloody converse. What are you doing? You can't have the conversation about rights without the conversation about responsibility because your rights are my responsibility. That's what they are, technically. So you just can't have only half of that discussion. And we're only having half that discussion. And the question is, well, what the hell are you leaving out if you only have that half of the discussion? And the answer is, well, you're leaving out responsibility. And then the question is, well, what are you leaving out if you're leaving out responsibility? And the answer might be, well, maybe you're leaving out the meaning of life. That's what it looks like to me. It's like, here you are, suffering away. What makes it worthwhile? Rights? You know, you're completely out, you're completely, you have no idea what you're, you, it's almost impossible to describe how bad an idea that is. Responsibility. That's what gives life meaning. It's like lift a load. Then you can tolerate yourself, right? Because look at you're useless. Easily hurt, easily killed. Why should you have any self-respect? That's the, the story of the fall. Pick something up and carry it. Pick, make it heavy enough so that you can think, yeah, well, useless as I am, at least I could move that from there to there. Well, what's really cool about that is that when I talk to these crowds about this, the men's eyes light up. And that's very, like I've seen that phenomenon because I've been talking about this mythological material for a long time. And I can see when I'm watching crowds, people, you know, their eyebrows lift, their eyes light up because I put something together for them. And that's what mythological stories do. So I'm not taking responsibility for that. That's what the stories do. So I say the story and people go click, 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 you know, and their eyes light up. But this responsibility thing, that's a whole new order of this, is that young men are so hungry for that, it is unbelievable. And one of the things I've been talking to some of the people who've been um, running for the conservative leadership in Canada, and I've been talking to them about well, the difficulties they have communicating with young people, because conservatives, what, what the hell are they going to sell to young people, right? Because being conservative is something that happens when you're older. They can sell responsibility. No one's selling it. And the thing is, for men, there's nothing but responsibility. You know, I was watching The Simpsons the other day. I watched the first Simpsons episode, and, and I deconstructed it. And so it's really interesting. So what happens in the first Simpson episode is that it's Christmas, and Homer and Marge are going to buy some Christmas presents, but Homer doesn't get his Christmas bonus. And so he's absolutely crushed by that. And that actually is a recurring theme in The Simpsons, where Homer loses his job or something like that, or can't make enough money. He's completely crushed. Even though he's kind of useless, bumbling, laughing fool of a guy, you know, the, the thing that gives that show its soul is that he's still oriented towards his family. That's what makes him honorable, is that foolish as he is, He's decided to adopt responsibility for his family and to try to bear that. And so he's not, he's a holy fool. He's not a complete fool. 
And it's so interesting watching the story because he suffers dreadfully as a consequence of not being able to fulfill his responsibility. Well, that's for men. Women have their sets of responsibilities. They're not the same, right? Because they're complicated, because women, of course, have to take primary responsibility for, for having infants at least, but then also for caring for them. They're, they're structured differently than men. For biological necessity, even if it's not a psychological issue, and it's also partly a psychological issue. Women know what they have to do. Men have to figure out what they have to do. And if they have nothing worth living for, then they stay Peter Pan. And why the hell not? Because the alternative to valued responsibility is impulsive, low-class pleasure. And you saw that in the Pinocchio story, right? That's Pleasure Island. It's like, well, why lift a load if there's nothing in it for you? That's another thing that we're doing to men that's a very bad idea. And to boys. It's like, you're pathological and oppressive. It's like, fine then, why the hell am I going to play? If that's, the, if that's the situation, if I get no credit for bearing responsibility, you could bloody well be sure I'm not going to bear any. But then, you know, your life is useless and meaningless and you have, you're, not, you're full of self-contempt and nihilism and, and that's not good. And so that's why I think, I, that's what I think is going on at a deeper level with regards to men needing this direction. A man has to decide that he's going to do something. He has to decide that. Yeah, well, you know, partly what you're trying to do in the future authoring process is say, okay, well, what's your highest value? Right? It's the star. It's like, okay, what are you aiming for? You can decide, man. But, you know, there's some criteria. It should be good for you. It should be good for you in a way that facilitates your moving forward. Maybe it should be good for you in a way that's also good for the family and the community. It should cover the, the domain of life. I mean, there's constraints on what you should regard as a value. But, you, but within those constraints, you have the choice. You have choice. Well, the thing is, is that people will carry a heavy load if they get to pick the goddamn load. So, and they think, well, I won't carry any load. It's like, okay, fine, but then you're like the sled dog that doesn't have a sled to pull. You're just gonna, you're gonna tear pieces out of your own legs because you're bored. You know, you need, people are pack animals. They need, they need to pull against a weight. And, and that's not true for everyone. It's not true particularly, say, for low conscientious people. I mean, maybe they're open and creative or extroverted and some other things. But for the, for the typical person, they, they, they'll, eat they'll eat themselves up unless they have a load. This is why there's such an opiate epidemic among uh, dispossessed white middle-aged guys who are unemployed in the U.S. It's like they lose their job, they're done. Right? They despise themselves. They develop chronic pain syndromes and depression. And the chronic pain is treated with opiates. It's like, that's what we're doing. So, yeah, that's what it looks like to me. Is you, you have to, and it's so interesting to watch the young men when you talk to them about responsibility. They're so goddamn thrilled about it. It just blows me away. It's like, really? That's what's, that's the counterculture. Grow the hell up and do something useful. Really, I could do that? Oh, I'm so excited by that idea. No one ever mentioned that before. It's like rights, 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 rights. Jesus, it's, it's, it's appalling. It's, it's, and, and I feel that that's deeply felt by the people who are, who are coming out to, to listen to these sorts of things too. They're, they've had enough of that. So, and they better have because it's, it's a non-productive mode of being. Responsibility, man. That's where the meaning in life is.